Hi, welcome everybody. Good morning. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum to everyone. Hello, Thank you hello. for joining us today. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi everyone. Thank you Hi. for joining us. Thank you for the viewers on YouTube in conjunction with World Environment Day with the team Celebrate Biodiversity. So today we're going to have a web forum uh, with the title What Science Says and Why Wildlife and Habitat Protection Need to Underscore Efforts to Prevent Future Pandemics. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Ahmad Zafir bin Abdul Wahab, the, uh, now the Head of Education Research and Training at the Habitat Foundation. I'm also the Vice President of Society of Conservation Biology, Malaysian Chapter. And I would like to say thank you, thanks a lot to the Habitat Foundation for helping us, helping SCB Malaysia to co-organize this web forum. So through this forum, let me give some introduction first. Through this forum, we aim to uphold the most current and credible science on the origins of the virus COVID-19 that we have been facing right now to dispel the myth and fallacies and engage in a discussion of measures to avoid future pandemics. Okay, so to discuss the topic today, we have four experts from range of disciplines to give us different perspectives on the issue. Okay, first, I would like to introduce our panelists. Okay, we have Dr. Jairaj Kumaran, who is a mammalogist trained in the field of evolution taxonomy of small mammals. He is an associate with Academy of Sciences Malaysia, has worked with various agencies, government, government departments, local and international NGOs on research and conservation of small mammals in Malaysia. He's currently a lecturer at UMK, University of Malaysia Kelantan, Jeli. He is the current president of Society of Conservation Biology Malaysia. Hi. Okay, that's Dr. Jayaraj or, or better, uh, prefer to be called Raj, is it? Ah, uh, no, uh, Raj. <laughs> Makes Dr. life Raj. easier. <laughs> okay. Okay, next we have Dr. Shima Abdul Aziz, who is the co-founder and president of RIMBA, a local non-profit research group that conducts applied conservation science to help produce evidence-based solutions for real-world conservation problems on the ground. She is also the principal investigator of Project Petoropus. Okay, Petoropus is Keluang, uh, the fruit bat research and conservation project and a steering committee member of the Southeast Asian Bat Conservation Research Unit. She has 17 years of experience working on a wide range of conservation issues, protected areas, local community enforcement, and banyak banyak lagi. Okay. Hi Shima, Hi. how are you? Ah, yes, very well, very thank you. you. <laughs> okay, next we have Dr. Chai Le Ching. Uh, this is a new friend. He's a microbiologist, senior lecturer at University of Malaya and also the chair of Young Scientist Network Academy of Science Malaysia, y -A -Y -S -N -A -S -M. Oh, that's, okay. Her research focuses on infectious pathogens, microbiological risk assessment and microbiological food safety. Currently, she serves as the Malaysian expert on microbial risk assessment for the Asian Risk Analysis Center and scientific advisor of ILSI Southeast Asia region. Okay. Hi, Dr. Chai. Hi. It's nice How to be you? here. How are you today? Great. Yeah. I'm working in the lab right now. Yeah, I can see you in the <laughs> yeah. lab. Okay, really yeah, sorry. today I'm on duty. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, next, last but not least, we have Dr. Jeffrey Roby Ryan Japning, uh, who is another old friend. He has 15 years of experience as a research officer with the Department of Wildlife and National Parks, Perhilitan. His expertise includes bioinformatics, molecular taxonomy and systematics, phylogenetics and phylogeography, molecular evolution, forensics and zoonotic diseases. Currently, as the principal research officer and head of research section, he plans, monitors, manages, and conducts DNA forensic services, genetic, ecology, and molecular zoonosis studies for the department. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Ahmad. Hello, everybody. So, how's the, how's the weather now in Charas? Uh, today clear, tak hujan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. As we all know, COVID-19 has changed almost everything globally. 
it has changed our lifestyle, it has changed our economy, it has changed uh, our, the way we take care of our health, uh, and even the way we conduct conservation works. So the origin of COVID-19 is said to lie in a sustainable exploitation of natural resources, how human exploit resources around them. And this has raised questions, how humanity has been treating Earth. So to start our discussion today, I would like to pose the first question to Dr. Raj. Ah, yes. Okay. Dr. Raj, can you please explain uh, how, how, how does it all happen? How is, what could have caused the pandemic of COVID-19? Okay, so I give you eight, eight minutes to 10 minutes. Uh, okay, uh, before we start about talking how all this happened, we first need to understand the ecology of the, the situation. Uh. So, uh, if you talk about ecology, basically, you are looking at the organism, uh, where, is, where it lives, what it eats. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, ne the next slide, uh, Shah. Ah, okay, so uh, when you look at the first top picture, when you talk about, when you go to an ecology of a species, uh, and when you want to say describe the number of individuals in a population, the number of individuals in a population is actually affected by birth and death, immigration and emigration. So of course, birth we know is very direct interpretation, birth of an individual. Uh, immigration is influx of other individuals from other areas coming into that population, and emigration is number of certain individuals leaving that population, and death. That, of course, directly related to our topic today eh, because uh, we are talking about viruses, certain diseases are related to this situation. And then when you, when you go to a further, uh, further analysis, you can see that all these organisms are actually involved in at least one of uh, one, one food web, okay? And, but when you see here, they really talk about the bacteria, parasites or viruses. And uh, even when you go to at the habitat level, you also don't see much people talk about bacteria and viruses and parasites in previous studies. But nowadays, this has become more uh, prominent uh, because of the advent of certain technologies that are available now. Uh, so one of the field of studies that we actually study uh, composition of bacteria, viruses and parasites is microbiome studies. And uh, in Malaysia, we have quite a number of labs that can do this, perform this kind of analysis. Uh. So take note that in, as an organism, you are not just alone. You are actually consist of a large number of other organisms that are actually inhabiting on various areas in your body. So example, if you're in, you, you, have, um, you have uh, bacteria and viruses all over your skin, you have it on your hair, you have it on your fingernails. So take note of this kind of situation so that you can understand what's happening next. Uh, next slide. Cha. Next slide. Ah, okay. Uh, the slide previously. One slide previously. So when you look at mammals in the world, we have Quite a number of mammals and species uh, in the world. Uh, we have around 5,000 over mammal species of the world distributed over 29 orders. Uh, okay. So, but 60% of these are either bats or rodents, meaning the ones that you see uh, in your media, the elephants, the tigers, those are large mammals. But 60% of the ones that you, you they are actually existing in this world is actually small mammals, those uh, the bats and the rodents. Uh. And because uh, a lot of uh, diseases in the past that have been associated with these two group of mammals, uh, a lot of uh, misconception has happened that to say that uh, bats and rodents carry diseases. So if they are around, we need to eliminate them, which is not true actually, because there is a recent study uh, that came out this year that analyzed whether is there a disproportionate 
uh, number of uh, pathogenic or pathogens or viruses uh, that are found in uh, different groups of uh, orders of mammals. And what they found is that it is actually proportionate. So there is no, no special order or no special group of animals that are uh, disease carriers. It is uniform throughout all the taxa. Just that the difference is that certain taxa has more diversity, hence more uh, viruses, more di different types of viruses that are found in those group of uh, mammals. Uh. So for example, uh, rodents, uh, if you capture any rodent, you will get viruses, but it's also the same with any other mem uh, taxa. It depends on the frequency of your sampling also. So next slide. Oh, I've been quite fast. Huh? Okay, let me slow down a bit. So this is where uh, the interesting happen. Interesting uh, stuff happens. I because of this uh, Corona, Corona COVID nineteen uh, situation, and you know we as uh, lecturers we need to you know uh, equip the students with the most current knowledge. So what I did was uh, I actually modified my lab manual. On, uh, on animal and plant systematics to include this COVID-19 uh, phylogenetics. So I took the liberty to go to NCBI, the National uh, yeah, the Gene Bank, uh, and uh, started downloading uh, DNA any sequences of uh, viruses, uh, COVID, uh, any coronaviruses. And then what I did was I did a phylogenetic analysis so what does a phylogenetic analysis do uh, show? It shows the relationship uh, among uh, samples that you include in the analysis. So Jeff is also one of our experts here. So he's been doing a lot of phylogenetic analysis. Uh, in fact, he's my, he's my mentor actually. Uh, so if anything wrong with my analysis, you blame Jeff. Huh? <laughs> okay, so uh, what I did was uh, I actually downloaded uh, viruses, uh, this uh, uh, spike protein, uh, the gene that encodes the spike protein for this coronaviruses. So when I start downloading, 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 I found out there were too many to be downloaded first thing, okay, meaning there is a lot of uh, studies being done and I believe uh, Pahilitan is part of those uh, people that have been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, I also found out that there are also uh, those that the studies that have been done are related to previous uh, outbreaks of uh, diseases, example, our MERS and our SARS. And coincidentally, I also found some of uh, some studies that, you know, may not be popular or may not be exposed in the media, but actually related to coronavirus situation that we are having now. Uh, if you look at the tree here, the green box, the, the samples that are in the green box are the ones in uh, small here. I need to look at my here. Uh, let me give me a few minutes. Oh, okay. The ones in the green box are the ones that are related to our SARS outbreak many, uh, a number of years ago. So when you look at it, there are samples isolated from humans bats and also seabed. So um, a single disease, but having a different uh, host, uh, but uh, we will need to further clarify this in the next slide. And then you have our current, uh, current uh, pandemic, our COVID, which is, uh, when you look here, I, I actually downloaded the one, the, the virus that is uh, isolated in pangolin, the one isolated in the bat, and the ones that are found in uh, several human specimens, uh, samples. Uh. So they are, they are related. So you have samples that are isolated from bats, samples isolated from, uh, from pangolin, and samples isolated from humans that are related. But we need further explanation on that. Uh. So, because just directly interpreting from this result is causing a lot of confusion. 
And uh, I've also seen, uh, if you look at the blue boxes, that is our MERS, uh, the sequences related to MERS viruses. Uh. So we have uh, those that are found in camels and those that are found in humans. Uh. Now, interesting, way back in 2004, there was one study that what happened was they actually uh, isolate some uh, uh, coronavirus from from a from a young boy and uh, they actually when they did some sequencing they found out that this virus is actually closely related to uh, a coronavirus that is isolated from a cow so that is also interesting to see that you have uh, a, a, a trait, uh, a behavior of coronaviruses uh, having a jumping from host to host. But in each jump, there is an evolutionary process that happen, and uh, you know, uh, allowing this uh, situation to occur. So one of the special trait that I've seen about coronavirus, based on a study that Dr. Jeff here is involved is in one big consortium on wildlife disease studies and I was I, I had the pleasure of reading that paper and what they found is that coronaviruses are they evolve most of their evolution happen during the jumping from one host to another host from cross species uh, host uh, host uh, infection uh. so this is the thing that is special about this coronavirus it has a large genome and uh, then hence allowing it to you know evolve in a certain manner and its evolution is actually driven by infecting different species of uh, host huh? Jairaj, so, sorry yeah. Jairaj, yes. sorry uh you have another, only what? one more minute one more minute oh that's yeah. that's slow okay <laughs> uh, i will continue okay next next slide Okay, so let's look at our uh, nee, uh, some of the viruses, nah, some of the hosts that have been found to be associated with virus, uh, nee, corona, uh, nee, COVID-19. Uh, but we will need to look for the analysis. Uh. So first is your Rhinolophus affinis. It's a cave dwelling bat found throughout Southeast Asia, right up to China. So that's why we have uh, our results that, you know, that uh, this uh, viruses, virus was isolated in China. And then uh, you have our pangolin, who also actually, you know, had a virus that is related to COVID-19. But we have to look further in terms of this comparison because uh, the comparison says that when there is 90% above, the event, uh, be between COVID-19 and those viruses that are isolated in these organisms, it's actually around 90% only. So when you take this comparison with how closely related with us, I um, mean, us with our our other primates, humans are actually ninety nine percent closely related, ninety eight percent closely related with chimp. Compare this to our coronaviruses com uh, comparison is actually quite distant. So we are not when you say when you see you isolate the virus from the bats and from the pangolins. And they say it's this is uh, related to uh, COVID-19. Yes, it is related, but it is considered distantly related because if you look at this comparison, it is it's quite far. So COVID-19 is related to the viruses that are isolated from these organisms, but it's not COVID-19. This one we have to be very clear. So. Uh, you go to the next slide. So how zoonoses are transmitted, there are a lot of factors. I think I will let Dr. Chai handle this since I'm short of time. But uh, definitely uh, we, we need to look further into our human, how humans are interacting with the environment. Huh? So next slide. So we go to here, this, this is the story here. When you look at the the location of these viruses where it has been isolated, uh, the one that uh, here, Rat G13 here, 
was isolated in a very distant area compared to the Wuhan market. When you look at the distance, the geographic distance between Wuhan market and the bed that is isolated there is, is quite far. So in terms of uh, logic sense, uh, you, 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 it is not possible for this virus actually to, to, be, to actually be found in Wuhan market. But maybe there is an intermediate host that has transferred this, or there is certain conditions. Okay, there are certain conditions where certain, several hosts have uh, as involved and lead to this uh, situation. So, do I have time any again? So you you run out of time already. Ah, okay. So, thank you. Never mind. Let others continue. You can add uh, the next rounds. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raj. Uh, okay, it's very interesting uh, when you say that it's not it's re related, but not not. But it's good. not COVID nineteen. That one we have to be very sure. Yeah, because some people has already made conclusions. Okay, uh, but before before we go there, I just want to inform the viewers on YouTube. Uh, we are going to have a Q and A session at the end of this uh, at the end of this forum. So later. Uh, after the third round, uh, you can write your questions in the comment section and then we can uh, get your questions and read, read to the panelists. And then if you have specific question for any partic any of the panelists, you can just write their names there. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go next to Dr. Chai. Uh, three quarter of infectious diseases in human are in zoonotic, uh, zoonotic origin. Okay, come from animals. So, can you please explain to me, uh, and those with no biology, uh, no microbiology diseases background, how can these diseases jump from from animals to human? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmad, for the question. Actually, like you know, to answer this um, question, so it's not so straightforward. Like you know, in one or two sentences that we can really like you know understand how this jump so please bear with me like you know i will just bring you through a little bit like you know the basic of pathogenicity of the um, pathogen itself um i just as what like you know dr raj has like you know mentioned that um the pathogens actually evolve and there has been always like you know, a relationship between microorganism on any living being, even on human, we actually carry a lot of microorganisms on us and inside us. And quite a number of these like, you know, microorganisms could actually be a pathogen like, you know, to wild animal or the other animals that we have never encountered with or we have never like, you know, come close with. So for the first time we encountered like, you know, any new microorganisms, it could be an enemy to us because our immune system just do not recognize us these new friends or a new enemy, whatever you want to call them, um, to be. And these could like, you know, bring up this immune system um, um, defense like, you know, against these um, new viruses or new bacteria that, we, that, that come into our body. So um, before we can actually like, you know, look into um, how it jumps, um, I just want to say that understanding how non-harmful microorganisms actually emerge um, to be pathogenic or disease causing and how it then actually jumps from animals to human and as well as from human to human is actually very important to, out, to help us to come up with like, you know, a way to stop the spread of any epidemic or pandemic as well as in preventing the next event of outbreak if uh, it would happen like, you know, in the future. So before we look into how SARS-CoV-2 that caused COVID-19 um, um, in, uh, causes diseases in uh, human. Let us actually look at the general criteria um, for a disease causing microbe um, to enter human cells and then cause diseases. So if you take like, you know, um, microbial pathogenicity 101, like, you know, you would have like, you know, come to these very basic um, steps for microorganism or new pathogens to um, enter a human cells that later on like you know cause diseases in human. So the first step is always um, the, the pathogen itself must establish this secure attachment on the surfaces of cells. 
the pathogen do not simply attach to any surfaces of human cell. So the attachment is very, very specific. So which means that on the surface of the pathogen, uh, be it a virus or a bacteria, there will always be a specific protein that actually act like a key. So this specific protein will actually bind to a very specific receptor protein that present on the whole cell membrane or any targeted cell. So the attachment actually function like a key and lock um, um, configuration. Okay. So once a secure attachment has actually developed, so the pathogen will use various type of mechanism to actually break open the barrier and enter the whole cells. So for viral pathogen specifically, so um, the viral pathogen actually will actually fuse or merge like you know the capsid or envelope of the virus with the host membrane, then release the DNA or the RNA materials into the whole cell or by injecting it into the cell itself. So this viral genetic material will then hijack the whole cells to make them into a viral factory to reproduce progenies of new viral particles that are then being released from the cells to infect more cells or the other host. So in another word to say, so if the virus or bacteria can't actually establish this very first step of attachment, then there will be no infection, no disease. So if they can attach but can't penetrate, there will be no disease also. So this is always like, you know, the first step that uh, we need to have. So specifically, so how does SARS-CoV-2 actually causes diseases in human? Can I have the next slide? Thank you. So let's look at this one. So um, although we have like, you know, a diagram over here, but it's just still um, not really proven um, as the exact mechanism. So we still do not really understand how SARS-CoV-2 um, 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 in fact, like, you know, human cells. So, but with the evidences that we have collected so far, so this could be how SARS-CoV-2 invades and causes disease in human. So SARS-CoV-2 actually carries receptor binding protein at the spike. So you can see that the spike on the, uh, on the envelope over there. So the receptor binding protein actually recognizes and binds to ACE2. So this ACE2 is a receptor protein that present on the host membrane. So ACE2 is very abundant in our respiratory tract, like in, in the lung, so as well as in the whole body. So interestingly, like, you know, um, actually um, SARS-CoV that caused SARS in 2003 also binds to ACE2, but with different efficiency. So the affinity of, um, of the binding protein on SARS-CoV-2 actually is way higher compared to the um, SARS-CoV that caused SARS, and therefore um, it's more efficient in causing diseases in human for SARS-CoV-2. So after the attachment, furin or the other enzymes such as the TMPRSS2 that also present on the membrane of the whole cells are believed to break the spike protein at one or more cleavage sites. And then this expose the uh, the fusion peptides and then fuse the, mem the viral membrane and releases like you know the DNA material into our whole cells and later on hijack like you know the cells to reproduce um, viral particle. So and in this process once the DNA uh, once the RNA material get into the whole cells so a series of immunity defenses will start and that causes all the um, symptoms that we feel. So can I have next? But when we compare the pathogenicity of SARS-CoV-2 to the other coronaviruses um, that also causes diseases in humans, for example, like you know, the four very common human coronaviruses that cause very common uh, and mild symptoms in humans, um, as well as like you know, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2 is actually quite different. So unlike SARS-CoV that causes outbreak in 2003, that has high, very high mortality rate, but spread to only a dozen of countries, SARS-CoV-2 actually affect almost every corner of the world with seemingly lower mortality, I would say, so as compared to SARS-CoV. This is because SARS-CoV-2 actually could infect the upper respiratory tract, which is our throat, um, and show very mild symptoms or even asymptomatic infection that cause like, you know, the containment of the disease way more difficult when compared to SARS, where SARS-CoV uh, usually cause like, you know, uh, infection in the lung itself. 
and once you are infected with SARS, so it will be very severe symptoms and there will be uh, very limited cases of asymptomatic as compared to SARS-CoV-2. So therefore it makes uh, the containment of SARS and MERS that time way more um, easier. So when we look at like, you know, SARS-CoV-2, it belongs to coronavirus family. And this coronavirus family is a huge family that has already existed on this earth for a very long time. So it actually contains various type of strains. So, and these various coronavirus strains um, can actually infect various types of animals as well as humans. So this is very, very common um, viruses, I would say. So certain coronavirus strain can cause diseases only in certain type of animal, but not the others. But a lot more coronaviruses has very broad host range, which means that it can cause diseases in various type of animals, including probably humans. So just like in the case that we see in SARS-CoV-2, so that it doesn't just in, uh, infect human, but cases has been reported that it also um, causes infection, like you know, in the other type of animals like ferrets or like cats and dogs. So the infection, interestingly, that we can see that is jumping from human to animal. So, but not the case from like you know, animal to human. So this is something very important for us to actually look at. Um, before some some of you might wonder, like you know, how this could actually happen. So as I've mentioned, coronavirus is a, a, a rather bigger like you know, viruses compared to the other influenza viruses that cause infection in human, lung infection in human. Um, the mutation rate in like you know, influenza viruses probably could be higher, unlike in coronavirus, that it has actually a very specific proofreading mechanism where it will correct mutations. So that occur on the genomic materials. So the major um, uh, mechanism involved in emerging of new strains that could help them to probably gain extra ability to jump um, from one species to another species and also uh, with probably increased virulence as we can say could probably due to uh, uh, to recombination rather than mutation so can i have next slide you, you only have one minute left okay. yeah <laughs> so unlike uh, as i've mentioned unlike influenza viruses that mutated rapidly coronaviruses frequently recombine and swapping genetic materials with the other strains of coronaviruses. When this happens, when two different strains actually come in very close proximity in an infected whole cells, which means that you need to bring like, you know, these two strains like, you know, together. This could happen quite frequently when like, you know, um, this could probably happen like, you know, quite frequently in the interaction of animals with animal like you know in the wild environment or in the nature environment so this could also happen like you know in human when we come very close like you know um, proximity with the wild animal that like you know it come into human and over time evolution occur and the recombination occur and the new strains came out that are able to bind on more efficiently to ace 2 and cause the diseases more efficiently in um, human so this basically is like you know how the emergence of new strains or new pathogens. So next. So um, can I have next? Yeah. So there are a lot more that we do not know about SARS-CoV-2. So some of the things that we already know, but a lot more that we actually do not know. So the major transmission route, like you know, that we know are actually via inhalation or ingestion of in infected droplet. But the major entry po uh, portal is actually respiratory tract. Although, like you know, a study have shown that it can bind to the other part of the um, human body. So, unlike SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV two infect both upper and low, lower respiratory with more asymptomatic carrier and a higher transmission rate. So, it can infect other organs once it get into the blood. So, SARS-CoV two binds to ACE two, um, which is very similar to the other coronaviruses, uh, but could have the other binding site that we are not clear yet. So evidence suggests that the holes actually cut the spike protein um, at one or more dedicated cleavage um, site, possibly with furin. And this is something very important that we want to probably study more because the binding with furin actually could cause, um, it's one of the major pathogenicity that we want to look at, like you know how it provides the virulence um, and such a high transmissibility rate for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, so that's all I want to share and thank you.
Okay, I, I have a, a short question for you. So, uh, just now in your last slide, you mentioned that it transmits transmit, uh, when you inhale the droplets. So, it's just, so when you're being, in, being very close to a, a, a wildlife with this virus, so if the virus sneezes or you touch it and you touch your face, so it, the, then the virus can can come onto you, isn't it? So so yes. can you please, yeah can you please more go uh, yeah I, in one minute yeah how how can this transmission happens between human and yeah from animal to to human? Okay, so when we look at like you know how the the spread or the transmission or the sharing of like jumping of pathogen from one species to another, so this happen like you know not just like probably wildlife to to human. But it's the same, like, you know, human to animal also and human to human. Um, basically, like, you know, the major route that we have observed over here is the transmission uh, um, wire droplets that contain viable or living viruses, which is the SARS-CoV-2 over here. So the amount or the number of viral particles that present in the droplet actually um, affect how serious you will get the disease. So over here, so therefore, the closer you get, the more viral particle that you inhale in the droplet itself, the living particles, so it's able to actually infect your throat and probably like, you know, get, because the, it's a number game, then it probably will get deeper inside your lung and these will cause a very severe infection and most of the time probably death that we, yeah, we can see in quite a number of cases. So um, the, the volume load and how lively, like, you know, um, the, the, the viral particle present in the droplet itself matter. So okay. therefore, how closely you come in contact matter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chai. Thank you for that. Okay, now let's go to Dr. Shima. Shima, uh, we have been seeing that there are reports, uh, even though Jaya Raj said that it's not confirmed that pets are actually the carrier or the, the cause of COVID-19. But we have seen some articles saying that our oh, bats is, are to be blamed. Uh, can you please uh, explain a bit about that? So how, how does it happen and then what uh, has it caused? What's the effect has, has so far been? Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Um, yeah, I'm going to start off with this slide first, just to, in case anyone is still confused about this, <laughs> just to dispel all the myths and misperceptions. Uh, Basically, this has been a very, very stressful time for bat conservationists, especially on top of the pandemic, on top of the lockdown, bat conservationists also face this extra burden where we have had to actively step up to debunk all these myths um, and uh, misinformation that have been spread regarding bats um, and how they may be related to this pandemic. So... Um, this, this has happened despite the fact that, as Dr. Raj has already pointed out, um, there's no evidence showing that this virus is actually in bats or that bats actually transmitted it to humans. And in fact, it's very important for us to realize that so far, all the scientific evidence we have shows that um, there is no evidence of a direct coronavirus threat from bats to humans. Um, there have been no cases where bats have actually directly transmitted deadly coronavirus diseases to humans. This has not happened. Um, and so usually, you know, bats are so genetically uh, distant from humans, it's actually very difficult for, for bat viruses to be transmitted to humans. Um, it, it's not easy and it's, it's very rare for this to happen. Usually this requires um, a specific situation where humans have done something to put ourselves into direct contact with bats, uh, direct physical contact, or accidentally ingested their droppings. Or sometimes also, um, and this is what happens more often, um, human activities actually bring another animal into contact with bats that wouldn't normally be in physical contact with bats. And so this other animal then um, not only functions to transmit the virus directly to humans, sometimes it also amplifies the virus to make it more deadly. Um, so this is, is, is these are usually the conditions that are needed before a bat virus can actually be transmitted to a human. Um, the problem now is that uh, there's been, as you pointed out, 
a lot of speculation in the media and a lot of fake news in the media. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misinformation that's been spreading around claiming that bats are the source of the virus and bats are the cause for the outbreak. And um, this, uh, I think we need to understand why this is happening. This is not a new thing. Basically, every single time, you know, there's been this major disease outbreak, bats are, are always implicated. Um, and there's a lot of uh, scaremongering that happens in the media. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, the media will uh, either exaggerate the disease risk to the public when the, the actual disease risk is low, but it's been exaggerated by the media. Uh, and sometimes the, the disease risk is not even... Um, it, it, it's non-existent, but the media portrays it as if it is a disease risk. So this is the case, uh, for example, when it comes to Ebola. So despite all the claims in the media, uh, the virus that causes Ebola in humans has not actually been found in bats. It has not been detected in bats yet. But the media reports it as if it's a scientific fact. When and actually, there's a movie about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the, the, was, movie, the movie was actually based on Nipah virus in Malaysia. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the, the fact is that there's still no scientific evidence to support this claim. But a lot of the time, it's exaggerated in the media reports. Um, and we have to understand that, you know, obviously, the media thrives on um, sensationalizing information. Uh, but there's also another reason why bats are constantly implicated in a lot of these disease outbreaks without concrete supporting evidence. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, Sha. Okay. So there's actually a very important social cultural basis for why bats are constantly represented this way, which we have to understand. Uh, you know, uh, our international media is dominated by Western media and Western media is influenced by uh, their Western cultural context. And <laughs> what, what we need to understand about Western culture is that they have had this social cultural bias against bats uh, for a very very long time okay for centuries in western culture bats have been viewed very negatively they have been viewed as scary they've been associated with the devil and demons um and so vampires. western culture yeah and vampires yes and halloween so western culture already has this cult, you know this cultural hangover when it comes to bats and the way bats are perceived um, and this is actually in direct contrast to the way bats have been historically and traditionally perceived in Asia Pacific cultures. So in our own native Asia Pacific cultures, actually bats were perceived as being benevolent, auspicious and inspirational symbols. We didn't actually have these kind of negative perceptions of bats that Western culture has. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of our own traditional and native beliefs around bats um, have actually started dying away. Some have already died away and become superseded by the Western cultural beliefs instead. So Western culture pretty much dominates internationally. It's influenced every corner of the world now. And um, this means that Western negative perceptions of bats are also influencing the rest of the world and superseding more native and indigenous perceptions of bats. And so because Western media has such a powerful influence globally, and Western media is also influenced by their own cultural hangovers when it comes to bats, this is reflected in the kind of uh, reporting and the stories that you see in the Western media around bats. So um, a lot of the stories that have been portrayed in Western media about bats, uh, they very frequently represent bats as being scary, as being dangerous. Uh, a lot of the language that they use is also a very scaremongering language. Um, and unfortunately, when these uh, these kind of news reports get out to the rest of the world, the rest of the world also believes it to be true. Um, the, the rest of the world also becomes influenced by these negative perceptions of bats. Um, and a lot of um, you know Western culture, especially American culture, has uh, spread to other parts of the world, um, and they. Uh, it carries this, uh, neg these negative attitudes towards bats as well. So uh, actually one example is um, how Halloween is now becoming a more popular celebration around the world, even in Malaysia. This is actually a, a very American thing and Halloween um, consistently associates bats with things that are scary and spooky. And so even something like this that seems harmless 
can actually have a real world impact in influencing people's perceptions towards a specific animal and whether they see that animal as good or bad. So we have to understand that this social cultural basis actually plays a strong uh, role in the way uh, Western and international media has been portraying bats and how it has influenced um, people's perceptions of bats around the world. Um, and unfortunately, when this started, uh, you know, all these premature speculations and scaremongering happened in the Western media, it then um, led to fake news being circulated. So if you've seen that video, uh, which claimed that COVID-19 started because Chinese people were eating bats, um, you should know that that is fake news. It was debunked already. Um, the video was not from China. It was actually from Palau in the Pacific, uh, where people have traditionally eaten, uh, eaten flying foxes. And the bat in that video was actually a flying fox, a tropus. It's not a bat that's found in China. It's not a bat that is you know, normally or traditionally eaten in China. And it's a completely different species. It's a completely different family of bats from the one that carries the coronavirus that is related to COVID-19. So it's not even the same kind of bat. But the spread of that fake news was damaging in two ways. It was incredibly damaging in terms of um, stoking fear of bats. So it, it really created this impression in people's minds that uh, bats are the ones carrying the virus. But it also created this misperception that this outbreak happened because people in China were eating bats. And that's not true. That's not what the scientific evidence has told us. Um, it's actually very rare. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence of bats being heavily consumed in China. Um, they're not one of the common species that you find in the wildlife markets in China. Flying foxes are not found in China. They're not normally traded to China. Um, and yet this um, myth was spread as if it, it was a, a fact that this is what started the COVID-19 outbreak, and that's wrong. That's not the case. Um, we don't have any evidence that bats were at the market in Wuhan. Um, and we, we, we don't have any evidence that any consumption of bats may have been related to this outbreak. It's very important to understand that. This doesn't mean there isn't a disease risk. Um, there's always a disease risk, as I mentioned, whenever uh, any kind of physical contact occurs between humans and wildlife. So if you're consuming wildlife, if you're hunting wildlife, if you're trading wildlife, there is a disease risk. Uh, as Dr. Raj pointed out, this is what caused the SARS outbreak. It was because civets were being traded, were being consumed. That's how the SARS outbreak happened. So there's always a disease risk when you consume wildlife, when you, when you hunt wildlife, when you come into physical contact with wildlife. Um, and in the case of bats, we know that they do, you know, they're not known to carry this particular virus, but they do carry other deadly viruses. So if humans are making that choice to come into physical contact with bats, then you are creating that disease risk. And so it's important to understand that even though there's no evidence that trade or consumption of bats created this outbreak, the disease risk is still there. And so you want to avoid creating that disease risk. You want to prevent it from happening. Um, you have one more minute, Dr. Shima? Oh, really? Oh, dear. <laughs> I have a lot more to say. Um, okay, can we go to the next slide? Um, so the problem with this prem premature speculation um, and simplistic messaging that's used in the media is that it, it you know, it, it has real world implications. Um, you know, uh, people, uh, when they're influenced by negative representations or negative perceptions of bats, they're already primed to believe bad things about bats. You know, if someone already doesn't like bats, then they're much more willing to accept information that supports their belief that bats are bad. Even if the information is wrong, um, they'll still believe it, especially if it's conveyed using suggestive language. So, you know, when you, uh, the media uses terms like most likely, that's very, very suggestive. Um, and also, uh, there's a problem when the word origin is used in these media reports. This is uh, an important point I want to make. Uh, it's really important to understand that when scientists use the word origin in this way, when they say that bats uh, may be the origin of the virus or the original host or reservoir, uh, what they're actually referring to is a distant evolutionary origin. 
it doesn't mean the immediate origin of the exact virus that's infecting people in this moment. Um, it's, it's the same as saying uh, Africa is the origin of all humans. You know, it refers to evolutionary relationships. Um, and unfortunately, this is not explained enough. Um, it's not put into context. And so when people read these media reports, they think that it's bats infecting people when it's actually not the case. That's not what the scientific evidence is showing us. Um, and so as, as scientists, as communicators, we have to be extra special careful when we uh, report our research or the results of our research when it relates to bats. You know, whenever we communicate about any research relating to bats, we have to be much more careful because there's already this social cultural bias that predisposes people to believing negative news about bats. And so we really have to be careful about the language that we use. Um, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so we have to avoid creating a situation where we lead people to fear bats. Um, and again, I'm just going to uh, reinforce the point that Dr. Raj made. Um, this is the paper that he was citing. Uh, this review came out in March and it found out that um, humans pretty much face an equal disease risk from all kinds of different animal groups across the board. And so bats do not stand out as being exceptional in this case. And we also have to understand that virus does not equal disease, which is what Dr. Chai pointed out. Uh, a discovery of viruses does not automatically equate to a discovery of disease risk. So just because there are diseases in an animal, sorry, just because there are viruses in an animal doesn't mean that those are going to turn into diseases that infect people. So the disease risk doesn't come from the animals. The disease risk is created by people. When humans, um, disturb, degrade, destroy wildlife habitat, uh, when humans bring ourselves into physical contact with wildlife or other animals, we bring other animals such as domestic animals, livestock into contact with wildlife, we are creating that disease risk. If we actually maintain uh, the viruses in their reservoirs, in, in the, their natural habitat, undisturbed, there's actually no disease risk. So the important thing to, to understand is that the best way to uh, prevent um, zoonotic transmission or spillover, uh, the best way to really address this problem and uh, keep humans safe and healthy is actually conservation. Conservation of wildlife, conservation of wildlife habitats is, is the best form of zoonotic disease prevention. Um, so yes, I think, I think I'm done. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Shima. I think uh, the the Western culture of not appreciating bats or fly, uh, fly, flying foxes, keluar and all, is because they don't have durian. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 don't, so they don't appreciate as, as we do. But then, even though Malaysians are now, they don't really see the, the importance of bats and keluar and all this in pollination, durian, mangis, uh, rambutan, and all that we have. So without them, yeah. we won't have those great fruits. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're actually very lucky because we have pollinating bats. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jeff. So now I guess. Yes. Uh, so uh, Dr. Shima mentioned that okay, the the virus are there. All different species of wildlife has all these uh, different types of virus in them. Uh, so should we be worried? Um, should Malaysians be worried? Uh, monkeys in the forest or uh, seabirds in the... Uh, some Now people have been complaining about seabirds living in their, in their roof or in the ceiling. Right. So should we be worried? So uh, what has uh, Jabatan Perhilitan uh, been doing to, to monitor this? Yeah, please, Dr. Jah. Sorry. Uh, good question, Ahmad. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmad, as our moderator today. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the Society for Conservation Biology, as well as uh, Habitat Foundation for organizing and inviting me as a panelist in uh, this webinar. Uh, so for this uh, webinar, I was given the opportunity uh, to share with everyone on, uh, yeah, so, uh, on what are the uh, efforts and actions uh, taken by Peritan in terms of issues uh, related to zoonotic diseases from wildlife uh, and to relate this to the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. 
Uh, next, please, Shah. Right, thanks. So uh, for 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 info, especially for uh, semua yang belum tahu, so Perlitan is the authority in uh, wildlife conservation and management here in Peninsula Malaysia. So in general, there are eight ma major functions of Perlitan. Uh, so namely, management of protected areas, uh, enforcement, uh, ex situ, and in situ conservation, ecotourism, and so on and so forth lah. Okay, so specifically for our topic today, I'm gonna not, not going to be uh, very scientific like what uh, Dr. Chai and as well as Jaya talk about all this disease transmission, whatever. But I'm going to talk rather uh, on what have we done. Uh, so Predator has actually been actively doing surveillance and uh, monitoring of wildlife diseases uh, under a, a specialized program. So we call this program uh, the Wildlife Disease Surveillance Program or WDSP. Right, so next please, Shah. Right, so uh, as mentioned uh, earlier uh, by Dr. Chai, I think, uh, it is well known now that wildlife species are the reservoir and host to various diseases, okay? So 61% of all non-human pathogens are zoonotic. And among newly emerging diseases, 75% are originating from wildlife species. So this is, there's a paper uh, that explains this. Lah. So uh, therefore, it is important for us to have a, a targeted surveillance and monitoring program uh, to identify novel or new zoonotic pathogens before they can potentially cause outbreak. Right. So they, they, then the, the surveillance program would then act as an early warning system uh, for any potential uh, disease outbreak. Right, so uh, quite early, actually, Perlitan realized uh, the importance and the significant impact of uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, particularly to wildlife. And therefore, we began uh, developing our capacity in uh, 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 zoonotic around 2009, 2010. And then by 2011, we launched uh, WDSP program. All right, so next, please, Shah. Right. So, uh, so what do we actually do under this program? So, well, under this program, uh, we conduct continuous monitoring uh, and surveillance of wildlife diseases at protected areas, okay, and then at conflict and contact zones between wildlife, domestic animals, and also humans. Uh, also, wildlife at captive facilities, and uh, recently uh, we also conducted surveillance on confiscated live animals. All right, so under this program also, we form a dedicated and uh, highly trained uh, staff. Uh, we call them uh, the outbreak, outbreak response team or, or ORT. So the role of this team is uh, to conduct the surveillance and monitoring uh, program, uh, as well as responding to any reports of disease outbreaks from wildlife, right? So uh, throughout 2010, uh, 2011, 2019, that's, that is close to 10 years now, uh, we've collected quite a lot of samples. We've collected almost 22,000 samples from about 1,900 uh, individuals, okay? So uh, samples, that type of samples that we collect, uh, such as uh, rectal swaps, nasal swaps, throat swaps, uh, we collect blood samples, we collect tissues, organ samples. Uh, these are collected uh, under this program. Right, uh, next please, yeah. Okay, so what do we actually we look uh, for in this program? So uh, in Prilitan, we have, we, we uh, operate the molecular zoonosis lab, which is a biosafety lab two, uh, level, a biosafety level two lab. So at the moment we are screening these samples uh, on five viral families, yeah. So this includes this includes coronavirus, uh, filovirus, flavivirus, influenza, uh, as well as uh, parimixob virus. Uh, so these are done with our collaborator, with assistance of our collaborator, Eco Health Alliance. Okay, and recently uh, we also screen our pangolin samples uh, because all the, because all of uh, because of the news saying that pangolins is the uh, you know the horse of 
uh, the disease. So we screen our samples that, that we've collected for serology tests on uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that caused COVID-19. Uh, and this, uh, this was conducted uh, in collaboration with uh, University of Malaya, uh, UM, and also Duke of the National University of Singapore. So we work co uh, collaboratively. Lah. Okay. And then uh, a part of that, uh, we, are, we also uh, uh, form collaboration work yeah, uh, with several other local universities uh, and also agencies lah, uh, such as uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Department of Veterinary Science, uh, Services, sorry, uh, UPM, UKM, and also uh, Unimas and many other uh, other universities. So looking at other diseases uh, such as malaria, uh, we did on chikukunya, and then there's one time there's the outbreak of Zika, we did sampling and we did screening as well. Uh, and then we did also some work on leptospirosis and many more lah, ada banyak lagi uh, diseases that we look into. So, um, so in addition to our collaboration work with um, with the universities, uh, Perilitan is also part of a larger uh, network. We call it the Interministerial uh, Committee for Control of Zoonotic Diseases. So this is led by the Ministry of uh, Health uh, Malaysia as well as uh, Department of Veterinary Services. Uh, so this this committee is is a uh, is the bigger uh, network that oversees the disease management and also control in uh, in Malaysia. Lah. So Perlitan is part of that. Um, and then, right, I think, I think uh, Ahmad, I'm going to leave this, uh, my talk for this first round to this first. Uh, thank you and back to you, Ahmad. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So, uh, so from the thousands of samples uh, that you've got, uh is there any particular interesting findings of that we should be concerned about yep um let, let me just pull out this slide which is not part of the slide that i provided so throughout the close to 10 years that we uh, did our uh, surveillance and monitoring uh and out of the uh, 22,000 samples that we've collected we managed to identify um quite a few no novel viruses, yeah? Uh, and in terms of coronavirus, we actually found four new or novel uh, coronaviruses and all are coming from bats, right? So when, when, I, say, when I say it's new, uh, please be uh, 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 safeguarded that these uh, new or novel viruses, uh, they, they, at the moment, uh, they don't pose any threat to human human uh, community lah. So, but but there is a need for us to work together, especially dengan university and also Ministry of Health and uh, veterinary services, uh, to look into the epidemiology lah. How uh, macam uh, Dr Shima and Dr Chai kata tadi, how this uh, how the virus, you know, uh, mutates and um, masuk kepada human population. So that is what is quite lacking here in Malaysia. So, kita dah ada the system, the monitoring and surveillance system. We can find uh, novel viruses. The next step is to see uh, the level of threat of this, uh, you know, these new viruses. Will it be of threat to human population or our dom domestic animals? That is the thing that we should focus into. So, there's, there's, there's no immediate point to be afraid or takut to masuk hutan or well, yes, and as uh, as Dr. Shima also mentioned, uh, the best way to avoid getting all these new diseases or white diseases is just to leave the wildlife alone uh, at their habitat. So uh, we manage the habitat as Dr. Shima kata, uh, and then at the same time, we the scientists uh, do our work lah. Tengok apa yang ada in the in the in the uh, the habitat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jeff. Yeah, it seems yes. like. Uh, Pohilitan has, has been doing a good job for the past you know, almost 10 years. Uh, well, 20 plus thousand samples. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of samples. I, I can't be, I don't want to see and, that. And, and these samples are actually, you know, whoever are interested to do screening on, on any other disease, we, we are always open for collaboration. So it's ready there for to be used 
for for our for research. Okay, so researchers out there who want to look into who want to have a look at the samples and to contribute uh, to collaborate with Dr. Jeff, yeah, please contact Jabatan Perhelitan directly and ask for Dr. Jeff. Okay, that's the end of our first round. So now we have heard the background of the issues, the origin and how about the contact between wildlife and human and all. So now I want to go, what can we do? So that's the next round, what can we do? So for start, uh, I want to go back to Dr. Raj. Uh, from your expertise, uh, in terms of uh, wildlife habitat and habitat protection, what should we do? Uh, to ensure that there's no more pandemic such as COVID-19. Uh, please, Dr. Raj. Mm, frankly speaking, I think the answer has been out there for many, many years. Even Shima reiterated the same answer. Okay, the first thing we need to be very clear is that human population growth is very unsustainable. Huh? This is the biggest issue now, actually. Uh, we can, you know, say, oh, this is manageable. But the fact is that we have been, our population growth is very high. And because of this, you can see that we are, we are doing certain things that, you know, pushing and pushing our environment to the brink of uh, uh, no, a point of no return. Huh? So, of course, when you exploit your environment, there is always some implication. So example here, you, you keep on uh, 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 open, opening new areas for development, then you will have, uh, you know, certain things that happen. So example here, rampant exploitation of natural resource. You keep on exploiting your natural resource, you are pushing your wildlife and vectors close to contact with rural community. That is one of, I think, the biggest uh, thing that we need to look into. Uh, the other thing that we may want to be more concerned is unregulated wildlife trade. Wildlife is traded. We have to be very clear about that. Wildlife is traded. We have certain regulations where how wildlife is traded. But the problem is there is a lot that is not regulated. So now you imagine when you are buying an animal, okay, you are buying an animal that you are unknown of origin. How sure are you that animal is free of disease, free of parasites? So that is one thing that we, the, the public need to know, okay? Now, of course, what we can do is stop deforestation. That is definitely one of the so-called known causes uh, of uh, this kind of pandemic. Uh. So uh, I, I, I'm unsure why I'm repeating this actually, because it's been out in the media all the time but somehow people don't get to hear this so next slide so uh at, at our level you, you can see that there are actually certain signs where you know there is wildlife that are actually coming close to human communities because of development or because of opening of new roads collection okay Okay, sorry, we missed everyone for, for a few seconds there. The, the ah, thing, okay. uh, can you please repeat uh, a bit? Uh, so we have been exploiting our natural resources in an unsustainable manner and we are pushing our, our yeah, wildlife closer to closer to human population. So if we, we, we can't deny that a lot of uh, wildlife is actually reservoirs of uh, this kind of uh, diseases. Uh, you see, like Jeff also, their team has uh, discovered huh? corona, new coronaviruses. If we actually sample more, we will get it, actually. There, there was a paper, I think your, your paper, Jeff, that described, uh, if you sample 110 individuals, you'll get one new virus. So that is one thing that we have to be very sure, very clear. But one of the solution is that we don't put in ourselves in such harm by uh, having allowing this kind of habitats to be properly uh, uh, protected so that we we are not in a very close uh, we are, we don't expose ourselves into unnecessary risk so they are here 
Example, I've been studying bats for more than 10 years, but I'm still healthy. Yeah? So, meaning there is certain things we can do. Example, for me, I would practice proper hygiene. Yeah? You handle your bats, whatever, you wear your gloves. Uh, you know, there are certain things that we keep on updating okay to to ensure that we you know uh be protected from this kind of a situation so of course uh, uh bush bush meat consumption is one thing that we need to look into but this is a i would say considered a sensitive topic because there are people who are dependent on bush meat, bush meat consumption so but there are some projects that i've seen being successful uh, uh, example uh, small scale farming, game ranching, these are things that have worked to actually reduce the amount of dependency of, on bushmeat uh, consumption. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, 20 seconds, can you? Ah, okay, so at the university level, I would say if you are handling, you are conducting research on this kind of uh, situation, uh, you must have an uh, institutional animal ethics committee. So being the head of the UMK's Institutional uh, Animal Ethic Committee, uh, we are quite detailed in this kind of things. Uh, in fact, we are, because we have vet, veterinarians inside the university, we, are, we have a faculty of vet. So uh, we are, I mean, I would say we are well covered in that area. So that is one thing that I would encourage for uh, other institutions to have actually. Okay. Or at least engage the you know the institution that have this kind of uh, facility. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Raj. Thanks for your for your input on that. Okay. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to Dr. Chai. Uh, as a expert on microbiology risk assessment, and also expert on microbiological food security, uh, food safety. Uh, can you please uh explain to us in two to three minutes uh, what can what should human what should we do uh, as consumers uh, people are buying things um, eating stuff yeah what should be done please Dr. Chai. okay so I've got quite um, some requests like you know previously from some restaurants or company on like you know setting up certain standard or like you know help them to set up protocols so that they are allowed to probably um, sell and produce products of game meats or wild animals which is uh, very common but uh, i think the the issue over here is that um, during my consultancy with them is that i have been quite frank with them like you know we don't really have a standard like you know on how to properly manage the risk posed by consumption of uh, wild animals or game meats or bush meats or like you know a, a lot more so the reason so is that like you know we un under food safety we have set up quite a number of like you know criteria or standard what are the pathogens that we should test associated with certain type of meat like you know um cattle like in pork because we have long history of uh, our epidemiology study like you know understanding like okay so consumption of cattle like you know or um or mutton seems to be associated with say um e coli and consumption of chicken always like you know seems to cause outbreak of diseases of salmonella so all of these are actually part of zoonotic diseases we do have a standard we do have knowledge quite a lot because these are all farm animal where they are raised and maintained in a rather stable and um, um, less versatile like, you know, environment. So where we are pretty sure like, you know, what they have come into contact and what type of um, pathogens they could like, you know, pick up. Unlike wild animals where they, they have been like, you know, raised and go around in the wild environment, we have no knowledge and no information about what they could have picked up in the process or in the environment. And hence, like, you know, we do not know what type of standard we should put in. So what type of pathogens we should test in the lab to ensure that it is safe for consumption. So uh, in view of that, like, you know, I would say that um, for those who live in urban city, like, I'm not talking about, like, you know, those Aboriginal 
people who live in the jungle and depend um, on hunting for their food. So they have no choice but like you know to to do that. Like you know they have been doing that for for ages. But for for all of us who live in urban setting, we do not really have a need to actually expose ourselves to unknown risks. Uh, of consuming meats that we do not know where it actually comes from. So that's what I wanted to say. And also when we come to food safety, a lot of people say like, you know, oh yeah, in 100 years ago, we do not have such a problem. Why suddenly nowadays we, have, we, we are so concerned about food safety? That's because of urbanization. So how infectious disease spread is, we need to come in a very close proximity so that the disease can jump from one host or one individual to another individual. So living in an urban city, that definitely increases the risk of how a disease or pathogen could spread quickly in um, an environment or in a geographical region. Unlike 100 years ago where the human population are lower, so an infection or you know, an epidemic occur probably just contained in a certain village because human um, geographical distance are actually quite, quite huge. So they have that social distancing over that time but over here living in urban cities so that sort of just expanded and enhances like you know the spread of risk okay thanks thanks dr chai so okay talking about being close proximity to wildlife i'm gonna go to jeff dr jeff uh we have seen uh people feeding mon monkeys uh restaurants selling wildlife meat uh animals being traded online or, or sometimes people can what, uh, see on Instagram uh, people posing with exotic wildlife. So, uh, yeah, that's certainly being in close proximity with wildlife. So what should people do? What should the public do when they see such, such things? Right. Uh, thanks so much. So, yeah, so Sha is pulling out that slide. So, uh, yeah, we, we actually have a hotline number uh, which the public can call. Uh, uh, and and make complaints, yeah. So uh, the number is there, one eight hundred eight eight five one five one. And this line is actually available uh, every day, from eight eight a.m. and until six p.m., including public holidays. So you can actually launch uh, launch your complaints or reports or, or whatever uh, information that you have regarding uh, wildlife uh, illegal wildlife uh, uh, activities. So alternatively, uh, the public can also call uh any of the nearest perilitan office i think at the respective state and setiap daerah pun ada ada perilitan office so you can just go over head to the office and then uh, you know provide the information and this will be uh, investigated uh, and taken actions by our enforcement uh, uh, people lah from department uh, okay yeah. uh, just a bit more people love feeding monkeys in uh, like in Penang in the botanical garden if you go anywhere so what's yeah what's is that encouraged or should not be that should not uh, what, what do you say to people who love to yeah, feed wild animals wild monkeys especially right i believe the uh the department stand uh about feeding uh wild animals is basically to advise against doing so so again as you mentioned this uh uh instances or examples where where very close contact between human and wildlife would happen yang kita risau adalah this animal this this animals are wild so we can we cannot predict them so in a matter of um, seconds they will just grab you bite you scratch you and these are the point of entry of uh, you know uh, harmful diseases harmful viruses so uh, we i would say that we would uh, advise against doing so lah Okay, okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, okay, now I'm going to Shima. Earlier, uh, Dr. Raj mentioned that the importance of uh, keeping wildlife habitats aside. So, can you please uh, explain a bit more? I know Rimba has been involved in protected areas in Terengganu and all. So, can you just explain a bit more the importance of protecting wildlife habitats in, in ensuring that there no more such pandemic to happen again? Yeah, uh, so habitat protection is definitely an important component of uh, zoonotic spillover prevention. Uh, the more uh, habitat there is out there for the wildlife to thrive in, uh, the happier they'll be, so they'll be less stressed. And when they're less stressed, they're less likely tra to transmit viruses. Uh, but also if they have more habitat and more 
uh, native wild food resources, they're less likely to come into human areas, uh, to come into contact with humans. Um, and also, you know, in the case of flying foxes, for example, they need um, uh, habitat protection over a very vast, uh, wide area because um, they travel very far. And the more of this kind of vast habitat is protected for flying foxes, the less likely they will come into people's orchards and plantations to feed on people's fruit. Um, but uh, we also, we need to avoid creating this assumption that the only way to keep people safe is to completely separate people from wildlife. That's not true. Because not all wildlife will stay out there in the forest. There, there are you know, different types of wildlife species that have adapted to living amongst humans and in human spaces. Uh, even bats, and it's important to teach people that uh, they shouldn't fear this. You know, we shouldn't create this fear of bats or other wildlife that have adapted to living amongst humans. Um, bats, in particular, have a very long history of coexisting safely with humans in human spaces, uh, and um, this is not a disease risk as long as people don't come into physical contact with the bats, don't ingest bat droppings. Um, you know, it, it's safe. You'll be fine. You know, there's no need to fear bats because of this. So another important component is also public education. So we need to educate people how to live safely with bats, you know, to understand that if you follow these steps, there's very low disease risk from bats and other wildlife. Um, and people also need to understand the effects of trying to kill wildlife as well. So um, I mentioned how it's very easy for people to develop a fear of bats. And usually when this happens, what people do is they go out and they try to kill bats or they try to remove bats. This is actually very bad from a public health perspective, not, not just from a conservation perspective or animal welfare perspective, because scientific research has shown the more you try to kill um, a virus reservoir, or you try to interact with it, the more you actually accelerate the virus transmission. Um, so this is the worst thing that could possibly happen in terms of public health um, or prevention of zoonotic spillover. You, you, we, we really don't want to create a situation where people go out and try to kill wildlife or remove wildlife on their own. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, once wildlife disappears, then the benefits that we get from wildlife disappears as well. You mentioned durian uh, earlier. If people start killing bats in Malaysia, then the durians are also going to start disappearing. Uh, I don't think we want to see that happening in Malaysia. And so, you know, we need to educate people on how important it is to coexist with wildlife and learn how to share our space with wildlife in a safe way to prevent zoonotic spillover. Um, and also the importance of, of wildlife as well and how they benefit us so that people really understand the bigger picture and why conservation is necessary on so many levels. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shima. Okay, now we have come to the final round. Uh, I'm going to give, before we go to q and A. I'm just going to give uh, every panelist uh, one minute. One minute to give your summary, just for one minute. Okay? Uh, so let's start with Dr. Raj. Please, Dr. Raj, what's your conclusion? One minute. I would say um, we need to educate ourselves all the time. Educate and re educate. Information is out there. And the important thing is to refer to the experts. If you don't, if people who are not watching our forum today would not even know that uh, what we say, you know, that COVID-19 is actually not the virus that is actually uh, uh, what, uh, not uh, the virus that is actually found in the, in the wildlife, it's actually in the human population. So this is the thing that we need to be very clear. Education, uh, from, but I'm actually quite concerned uh, nowadays because uh, I think in a few days ago there was an uh, announcement by the education ministry that only 19% people took science stream in their, in their university courses. So this is a, this is a concern uh, because you need scientists to actually do all this kind of research and you know come up with solutions and uh, information but the, the lack of uh, interest in science is quite alarming in our country actually. So that's what I mean. Okay. Actually, yeah, so you want, you want people to start be more interested in science and to do yes. research on what and, and all diseases and all. Okay, uh, next, uh, Dr. Chai. I think like uh, we, we have shared quite quite a lot of things, but 
what I really think, like, you know, after experiencing so much and things like that, like, you know, you see how things move with, like, you know, the advancement of social media, technology, like, you know, 5G is coming, where information is, like, you know, really, like, you know, transmitting way faster than diseases. That's what I, I would like to say. And I, I think, like, you know, the world nowadays seems to be quite a polarized world, where, like, you know, when someone say, like, you know, oh, yeah, so it's good to have more vitamin C. Then suddenly you see, like, you know, there's the whole bunch of people, everyone suddenly, like, you know, will consume high doses of vitamin C, like, you know, when there's such a thing, like, you know, came on social media. So without really, like, you know, the, the support of science and things like that. So I think, like, you know, right now um, with COVID-19, I think it sort of also start to, to educate, like, you know, the public where we need to start to emphasize on science, like, you know, particularly information that's supported by science, but not just like, you know, a myth and things like that. So while scientists, like, you know, working, like, you know, in the lab itself, like, you know, on generating, like, you know, all the information and things, I think it's time for scientists also to be more vocal and come forefront, like, you know, to really share science, to talk about it and to support decision making. And particularly, like, you know, to support the general public on how to make a right decision, like, you know, in, in all of this. So, yeah, be less shy, like, you know, for scientists and really come out and share. Okay, thanks, Dr. Chai. Okay, now we're going to Dr. Shima. Okay, thanks, Dr. Ahmad. Um, for me, I guess the, the one thing I hope that people, you know, the one lesson I hope people can take away from this whole COVID-19 experience is to realize just how important conservation really is because conservation is not just about the wildlife. It's not just about nature or biodiversity. It's about us as well. We're also a part of nature. Whatever happens in nature, whatever happens in wildlife affects us as well. And you know, even if people don't care about nature and they don't care about animals for the sake of human health, you know, they should care about conservation and support conservation. So we really need more efforts to be invested into conservation measures because this is what will really help to secure human health. Yeah, thanks. And thanks to you for being involved in conservation. And thanks to all of you. Uh, okay, Dr. Jeff, please, one minute for you. All right. Uh, thanks so much. So uh, on my part, I would say that uh, Prilitan acknowledge uh, that we cannot work alone, yeah? uh, especially on matters related to uh, these zoonotic diseases, lah, especially coming from wildlife. Uh, so I I believe that under the One Health Framework, so we have the agencies, we have the universities, we have the public. Uh, so I think it's, it's important for us to form uh, this collaborative effort uh, with all these other in, uh, institutions uh, on these related activities lah, on, on zo uh, zoonotic diseases. Uh, so uh, for for my closing remarks, I would say that um, yeah, Pranitan will continue to do what we do best. Okay, so which is to give our best effort uh, to protect and conserve wildlife in Malaysia. So uh, we might stumble, we might stumble uh, sometimes here and there, uh, but uh, but don't condemn us, but work with us. So we need that collaborative uh, effort uh, uh, to help us to you know to conserve our life better. Uh, thank you. So back to you, Ahmad. Okay. Okay. Thanks uh, to Dr. Jeff. Okay. Now we are uh, coming into the question and answer session. If you have any questions, please write, type it down in the comment section. Okay. We already have a first question for Dr. Raj from Shamira Nasrin. Dr. Raj, how is coronavirus able to go through the evolutionary process in an extremely fast pace? Do you want me to read that? Uh, can you see that? You are muted, Dr. Raj. Sorry. Dr. Raj, please unmute yourself. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, okay. So, Samira is actually my student. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, let's say, okay, like this. Uh, in, in viruses and uh, in certain organisms, the the cell has uh, sorry the cell does not has the the, the 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 viruses does not have a repairing mechanism so unlike other organisms uh, unlike example a eukaryotic cell you have a repairing uh, mechanism where if there is changes of your dna that happens in your dna 
there is an enzyme and there is a mechanism that will actually correct that situation okay this uh, uh i mean changes in your genetic information but in viruses there's none hence that's why you see uh coronavirus evolved in a very uh, fast rate huh? so because of this lack of uh, uh, repairing mechanism in their genetic information the other one is because coronavirus is actually quite a, a virus that has a large genome so that one is pro uh, one of the probable reasons uh, this uh, situation is happening now because coronaviruses are also uh, evolve faster when it jumps between hosts so and when you look at wildlife wildlife you can get example like a bat a bat although it's a bat it's eaten by another organism it also eats other organisms so this situation actually allows this kind of uh, host jumping to occur and probably the what we call uh, uh, the catalyst for the change to evolution evol evolution to happen as long as uh, hence you you need to look at the genetics of this organism and the, the, the mechanism the repairing mechanism that is actually occurring okay okay thanks dr raj okay there's a question but then you didn't say for whom uh any of you can can answer this uh, it's from husni chikna can a strain of virus be assembled from materials coming from more than one strain which invaded the same host cell uh, i can read there on the on, on the screen so, so anybody want to answer this Yeah, probably I can just share a little bit over here. Okay. So um, to, to look at like, you know, how these things happen, uh, I would say like, you know, in short, uh, I would say yes, like, you know, um, the comp the recombination actually occur. So within one cell. So for, for two different strains, like, you know, they need to come together and they share their genetic materials and the recombination actually occur in like, say, if it infect human or infect another whole cell. So it recombine and produce a new um, progeny of like, you know, viral particle that probably could carry like, you know, two different fragments of the RNA material or DNA materials from two different um, viruses. So when this new progeny like, you know, come in contact with another like, you know, new um, strain, so then this recombination will occur again. So another way to say that, yes, it's possible. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Chai. Okay, next question we have from uh, Miss Lim. Will the virus eventually die? if it couldn't penetrate the host cell or will it remain in the fluid until it can find a host cell that it can penetrate? I think it goes to Dr. Chai as well, I guess. So I think like, you know, for, for this one, for whatever viruses or bacteria that we actually look into. So um, I think particularly to virus. So we need to understand how virus actually um, reproduce. So a lot of people argue like, you know, that is a virus a living organism so the answer is yes and no so when they are outside of a whole cells they're actually particle we call them viral particle because they basically do not have any um characteristic as a living organisms in which they do not replicate they do not grow they do not eat they do not excrete so it's just as a particle so how does viral virus like you know actually reproduce means that like you know you have progeny of new viruses so it's by entering a whole cells and hijacking like you know the mechanism of the cells to build to use it as a factory to build new virus particle so the question over here is that how long this viral particle would survive in the environment so it depends strongly on the strain itself the genetic that it carry um the the, the envelope that it has so the environmental parameters the uv light the humidity, the, um, the, the temperature. So all of these, and also like, you know, the type of surfaces, all of these does affect how long a uh, viral particle will survive. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question. I think this is either Jaya Raj or, or Jeff from Amin Baki. Is there any risk of humans infected with COVID-19 to spread the virus back to animals, to wildlife or to pets? 
Macam my student lah actually oh. <laughs> My post grad lah So oh. Amin is actually working on uh, ni lah, uh, pollination of durians uh, But not on uh, flying fox So Shima works on flying fox So I'm looking at another angle working on uh, apa uh, ionic crispy ah okay meta bad uh, so actually, of course I, amin ask this question i'm also okay. working on ionic trees i'm working on all bad pollinators of durian <laughs> ah boleh lah like nanti kita duduk semeja ah <laughs> uh, kita collaborate boleh lah so we duduk semeja uh, huh. so uh, actually uh, there is reports ah huh? we have to be very clear that there are reports uh, i i remember there was one on the tigers being affected by Yeah, the uh, we call it the uh, reverse zoonosis. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the term is uh, called reverse zoonosis. That there, there is a risk, but not uh, not we so called uh, uh, not a risk that is uh, high, but we are precautious about this. And uh, those they are studying bats are actually waiting for the IUCN uh, bat specialist group to actually give us uh, a so called SOP or Uh, a directive on how we are going to conduct our research so that there is no, uh, I mean, uh, reverse zoonosis happening to the wildlife, which, yeah, we we, 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 we we have to take note on that. So, I mean, you, for your need, we have to wait for a while and then uh, start buying personal protective equipment for your work. <laughs> okay, okay, you can talk later in your classroom. In, in your lecture hall. Okay, uh, next question for Dr. Shima from Noridah Osman. I, Dr. Shima, I accept that the bats did not cause COVID-19 in Wuhan, but is there a conclusive evidence to show what is the cause and why the Wuhan market was pinpointed as the cause of the outbreak? Okay, thank you for that question, Noreda. Uh, the answer to the first part of your question is simple. No, there is no conclusive evidence. That's part of the problem here that we have. That's why it's been so easy for fake news and mis misinformation to spread. It's because we don't actually know what is the cause. Uh, scientific research has not been able to answer this question yet. We just don't know yet. Okay, so um, it's still not clear what was the original uh, wildlife host of the virus. You know, how was this virus actually transmitted to humans? We don't know. Um, and I also want people to understand that the outbreak did not start at the Wuhan market. Um, again, this is misinformation that has uh, been spread around as if it's a fact. Um, this is wrong. Um, the outbreak didn't actually start at the market. The market has not actually been proven to be the cause of the outbreak because what they found is that some of the earliest cases of uh, COVID-19 uh, happened outside the market, far from the market, not associated with the market. But the market may have played a role in uh, facilitating greater transmission and spread of the disease. So what they think happens is that one of the earlier infected people may have come to the market and brought the infection to the market. But even this, this scenario and you know all the, the possible transmission routes, they're, they're very, very unclear because we're still not sure what actually happened and how it happened. But we know that the outbreak did not actually start at the market. Okay, thanks. Uh, then there's another question for you, Dr. Shima. Uh, uh, is the percentage of transmission from human to human, animal to animal, and animal to human are the same? Yeah, I I, I don't think I'm uh, the yeah, right I person think, to answer I that think question. So, uh, yeah, because I don't, I don't study zoonotic disease. Uh, so I don't know, maybe Dr. Jeff or Dr. Raj might be more. Or Dr. Chai. Yeah, who wants to answer this? Dr. Chai, yeah, sorry. The chai, you want to take it? You want to answer this? I, I, I don't think that at the moment we have any data to really answer, like, you know, this question on the specific, like, you know, percentage of transmission from human to human or animal to animal. Um, but what you can see always right now as, like, you know, the pandemic, uh, I mean, it is uh, it's ongoing right now. So we can see that, like, you know, it's it's the the main transmission route right right now is human to human um, majorly okay thanks we have another question from nur zakirah to dr jeff what is the chance that those new novel coronavirus from bats triggering an outbreak like the current covid 19. yeah another great question yeah so thanks nur zakirah so as i mentioned earlier um 
the 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 new the new novel viruses that we we discovered uh, at the moment uh, there is no evidence that I mentioned earlier there's no evidence to suggest that these viruses pose any threat to uh, human health okay so but but again um, we as i also as i mentioned we need to look deeper into 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 how this uh, novel viruses would be involved in the uh, epidemiology process so how 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 does it you know transmit from uh, bats to human if there is any possibility lah so that part kita belum lagi tengok we don't look into that lagi yeah so i i think also to extend uh, there's another similar question from uh, yai yai lin yao i guess sorry if i mispronounce that so uh, so how does the lab identify potential uh, disease outbreak uh, or or sound the alarm as mentioned so what we do in the lab is actually we we screen the samples using short segments of the rna or, or the dna virus yeah so it's very short sequence so we use universal uh, primer to screen uh, and then if positive then we'd say that uh, we don't have the capacity to to grow these viruses so there's another question saying that is there a level 4 uh, bsl biosafety level uh, lab in malaysia there's none at the moment uh, we have the level 3 but not level 4 so to do to look to look into uh, this this uh, uh, viruses we need uh, you know we need to grow the virus so this requires you know higher level of uh, uh, biosafety level lab lah uh, so yeah so uh, in conclusion i would say that at the moment we identify new viruses no threat to human uh, uh, population but again we have to be aware that uh, we might be finding more diseases so kita kena we have to we have to look deeper lah so we have to pelitan punya uh, expertise is more to monitor surveillance this information yang kita jumpa this novel viruses that you jumpa will feed that to the higher authority which is ministry of health uh, dbs under that committee and that committee will discuss and see what what is the uh, you know the next action that should be taken lah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, next question is from Ivan Kwan. I think this can be answered by either Shima or by Dr. Raj. How do we promote coexistence with urban wildlife while also managing concerns about disease spillover? A lot of people express worries about SARS, bird flu, rabies, etc., and ask for culling. Yeah. So, Dr. Shima or Dr. Raj? Mm, I, will, uh, I think we have to believe on the government departments. Uh. They are very uh, up to date. And, and in Malaysia, we have uh, our, our government departments, especially in the health ministry, is very efficient. Uh, we, this is not our first time, actually. We have experience and you know, Malaysia has experienced and at one point, we are actually references uh, to some of the countries on how we are dealing with this kind of uh, situation. So, uh, if there is a if there is such a situation, let's let the government department handle this situation. We, we, of course, we will be concerned of a lot of things. Example, you, if you have a cat at home, your cat also have a possible of getting certain diseases. But, if you know your cat is sick, first thing you need to do is get your cat to the vet. That is a very, very logic sense of uh, management of a situation. Huh? So if you know that there is wildlife around your area and uh, it's causing a certain situation, call Department of Wildlife. They will know what to do. If it does not pose any problem, then they don't. They will say it's not a problem. Example, civets. Uh, if they come and uh, disturb your uh, papaya papaya fruit, then you call pelitan, pelitan may resolve the situation. So it depends on trust the government department. They have experience. They are doing a fine job. Huh? Okay. Does Shima want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I want to uh, echo what uh, Dr. Raj just said about the government departments. I, I really believe that Malaysians should not be worrying about um, the threats of zoonotic disease um, not being uh, monitored or not being managed in Malaysia. Because as Dr. Raj pointed out, we actually have more experience and expertise 
working on these issues compared to a lot of the Western countries. So Malaysians mm. actually have a lot less to be afraid of compared to citizens of Western countries because we're so much better at managing um, these kind of zoonotic disease risks and spillover events. Um, but as I mentioned uh, before, also public education is, is also a very important component here because people need to realise um, the work that the government um, has done, the expertise that the government has. Um, and at the same time, they also need to be empowered to know what they can do as individuals. Um, and so simple things like how I pointed out, you know, culling doesn't actually help to prevent uh, disease risk or disease spread. Um, this is a very important message that we need to get out to people out there. Um, we need to uh, teach people how they can easily live safely, coexist safely with wildlife. Um, and this really, this, this kind of public education, it requires a lot of collaboration and coordination between, you know, all kinds of different parties. So, you know, the government, um, NGOs, universities, uh, everyone actually has a role to play in working together to get these right kind of messages out to the public. Okay, thank you. Uh, we plan to finish at 12.30. Now it's already 12.45. Get, and then there's still a few more questions coming in. Can I, can I proceed for another 15 minutes, uh, my dear panelists? Huh? Okay. Okay, so, okay. okay. A question by Miss Justin Vass. Uh, I think it's for Dr. Chai. Can we discuss the issue of factory farming and its role in making zoonosis more prevalent? Yes. I think like, you know, um, when we look at like, you know, how we, how we keep like, you know, all these animals uh, in, in the farm and things like that, like, you know, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a larger scale. So all of these actually like, you know, increases the risk of disease transmission and how, how, how disease spread. Because just like, you know, among animals, just like now when we talk about COVID-19, like we need to have like, you know, social distancing. So it's similar like, you know, in the case of like, you know, in a farm. Um, how you manage the farm, how closely and how hygiene the farm is, all of these actually matters. Like, you know, how healthy, like, you know, the, the, the farm animals are. Um, I think there has been quite a number of, like, you know, cases involved, like, you know, but not specifically, like, you know, to viruses, but, like, you know, probably bacterial pathogens, like Salmonella E. coli. So with, like, you know, a huge farm that is not well managed, like, you know, disease tend to spread faster and easier. And eventually, like, you know, all of this is going to affect human. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Chai. Uh, next question. Has this COVID virus made it harder from Regina? Regina J. Has this COVID virus made it harder in relation to wildlife conservation or its management? Uh, any, any volunteer to answer this? Or, or maybe the the moderator can answer. Can the moderator answer this? Oh, oh moderator can answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so far, with COVID nineteen, uh, because of the MCO, it has certainly affected uh, wildlife conservation, especially research that are being conducted. So at the moment, all the field monitoring has to be stopped, uh, and there's also issue of funding because of. Uh, the effect towards the economy. Uh, some some organizations could not get their funding, and there are also uh, some uh, conservation initiatives uh, actually rely upon tourists, ecotourism, uh, and with no tourists coming in, uh, there are no no income for them, and there are also uh, field research that depends solely on volunteers. So during MCO. So volunteers could not come and help. So these uh, organizations, these NGOs, have no manpower to 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 continue their work at their at their lab or at their field stations. Yeah, that's that's uh, my answer for that for Regina's question. Can uh, can I add on add on that, Ahmad? Ah uh, uh, yes, please. So in yes. terms of pelitan, so kita uh, the, at the very beginning, yeah, there's a bit of. Uh, uh, you know, confusion on how how would the department operate, especially in terms of conflict management, uh, enforcement activities. But and then when we came out with SOPs, and then uh, I, the department actually semasa MCO during the uh, restricted movement, staff are actually on the field doing monitoring 
in 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 wild habitat as well as responding to conflict uh, reports lah so so walaupun sebenarnya kita the department staff pun sebenarnya one of the frontliners actually so we we did not stop our activities but we continue in terms of lab pun uh, as my, i mentioned before masa uh, mco during the mco we did come to the lab and then we screen the uh, pangolin samples for uh, serology testing lah Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, the Jeff and also uh, our friends at Pelitan to be to be the, the, the front liners uh, yeah, confronting COVID-19. Okay. We have another question from Ilan Sigaran, Tanggamani. Why we fail to contain the virus, coronavirus that affects the whole world? We have experts all over the world, but we still fail. Uh, I don't think that we are failing. Uh, okay. Uh, wait, okay. I'll let the panelists <laughs> answer that. Any any comment on that? Hmm. I, I my knowledge about this is quite limited, lah. But uh, okay. Uh, let 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 Doctor Chai. I think I think Doctor Chai. Uh, Doctor Chai will be the best person <laughs> to talk about this. Uh. So I I think I think like you know as I've mentioned earlier that when we look at like you know this coronavirus when it first tried like you know. So we treat it like, you know, almost like, you know, quite similar to SARS that we have experienced before in 2003 because they are all from coronavirus family and have, um, like, you know, at that time, so I believe to be from quite similar origin, uh, although right now we are not so sure. So at the moment, um, when we look at, like, you know, the symptoms when it first came out, like, you know, the sharing of information and things like that. So it seems to be all the symptoms kind of like, you know, similar to SARS, hence, like, you know, it's called SARS-CoV-2, so it's a different strain, like, you know, when we get all the sequencing. Um, but when we apply the same containment system, like, you know, um, as compared to how we deal with SARS, so it seems like, you know, the spread continues. So it means, like, you know, the normal containment systems that we use, like, you know, whereby we quarantine, like, you know, patients showing the same, I mean, the symptoms, like, you know, um, contracting the disease in hospital doesn't seem to slow down the transmission at that time, so we know that the, the, the normal containment that we apply in SARS time doesn't work. So it seems like you know, there is a different way of transmission that we, do, we, are, we are not aware of. And eventually, we know that there is actually, unlike SARS time, there's very limited a, asymptomatic carrier. But over here, so in SARS-CoV-2, there are a lot of um, carrier or patient do not show any symptoms like coughing or fever. So enhance it make like you know the quarantine of infected patient very very difficult over here. So and therefore also these cause a broad uh, a widespread to so many different countries. So I mean that's one of the major differences like you know that we see in SARS CoV two and the SARS CoV that caused SARS in two thousand three. So and therefore like you know that we put down like, you know, a huge um, um, lockdown, like, you know, in country, which is sort of like, you know, the most severe and, and the last resort that we, we have to adopt to, so which is the lockdown. So to stop, because we do not know who is infected. Okay, thanks, Dr. Chai. Next question comes from Ms. Nadine Rupert. What's the best way or the best channel for the general public who wants to learn more about this topic or to engage in education about the risk and mitigation of zoonotic diseases in Malaysia. As a start, okay, I, I will answer this a bit and then I'll pass to any of the panelists. As a start, the SCB Malaysia chapter uh, will be sharing on our social media platforms all the, car the latest research that are being con has been conducted and all the latest papers and articles uh, for, for reading for those who are interested. Yeah, but yeah, but not many people will be interested to read articles and journals. So maybe yeah, Shima, Dr. Shima or Dr. Raj wanna comment on this? Uh, okay, well, I, I guess as a start, I should mention that uh, in Rimba, my NGO, we actually developed our own FAQ to set the record straight when it comes to the issue of how bats may or may not be linked to COVID-19. Uh, we have made our FAQ available online on our website um, and it is continuously updated as new information comes in. So I would encourage everyone to refer to that if you're wondering about COVID-19 and if you're wondering about you know, how bats are involved. 
um, because we really are looking through all the information that's available on this topic um, and we are constantly updating the information. So that's a start. Um, and if you can help spread that information um, to people in your social circles so that people, more people become educated and informed, that would actually really help to uh, dispel a lot of myths and misinformation. So from our side, that's what we're trying to do. But we do need more support from the public in helping us to spread the correct information and the correct messaging. Yeah, okay, thanks, Shima. Okay, the next question is from Najwa Afifa. Uh, I need to make it quicker. We only have four minutes. Is it possible that global warming also the cause of this COVID-19 virus to exist? I think, yeah, it's global warming. I think it's global warming like go there. I uh, I don't I don't think it it is the cause, but there are some instances where, example, uh, certain rodents which are normally they are supposed to be at low low land, okay, so they have shifted. Uh, they have, uh, sorry, the uh, rodents that are supposedly endemic to highlands, they are actually moving up. So, uh, and then there are some rodents, they are lowland, they're actually moving at higher elevation. So global warming causes this, is probably one of the reasons that cause this. So uh, where there's a change of uh, temperature, there's a change of environment, they may allow movement of animals into different areas. So if there is such a movement, there is a risk, there is a possibility, but there is no, I've yet to actually read uh, a paper that actually directly connects uh, uh, a disease that is connected to global warming. That's okay. from my side. Lah. Okay, thanks, Dr. Raj. Okay, next question is from YM Liu. I think Jeff can answer that. Uh, should there be an SOP if there were none currently for petting zoos, wildlife watching, and other ecotourism activities associated with experiencing wildlife? Uh, yeah, I, I believe the department is actually. Uh, I think some of the SOPs have been uh, put up by, by, by the department. I think some of it are being uh, reviewed by the MKN, uh, Majlis Keselamatan Negara. So I think uh, some of it, I, I believe some of it is out there already, especially involving uh, all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, petting zoos and uh, wildlife watching. But, but again, I'll check back with, with the team in, in our HQ. Lah. Okay, uh, I think we have come to the end of our web forum today. I would like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to our viewers on YouTube. Thanks to the Habitat Foundation for supporting this program, this program uh, to co-organize this session with us. Oh, there's someone who just say good morning. Is watching from Italy. Uh, hi, Brazos yeah. Camacho, working watching from from Italy. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot to dear panelists, to new friends and old friends. Thanks a lot uh, to, uh, for spending your time today, this morning. I hope that uh, the viewers have, have learned something uh, today and we have managed to dispel the myth and fallacies about uh, the link between COVID-19 and wildlife. And also, uh we know what are the the our responsibilities as uh human beings uh and what can be done what can we do as individuals in helping our nature uh helping the wildlife out there so uh thanks a lot uh before we end uh panelists please smile and look at the camera because we have a photo session okay okay uh with that Happy World Environment Day. Celebrate biodiversity. Stay safe. Stay at home, everybody. Bye-bye. All right.